Welcome everyone. This is Matt Schlapp and we're really excited about a, another edition of CPAC Live coming at you on this most special days, uh, Memorial Day, a day that's awfully important to each one of us and our families and us as a country, especially as in the Trump era, we are reconsidering how America, how America and America's strength is projected around the globe how our military and national security questions kind of interrelate with the basic economic questions, which we haven't talked about as much since Ronald Reagan was president with what KT McFarlane always tries to teach us about, which is what peace through strength meant. It didn't just mean spending billions of dollars at the Pentagon, although it most importantly did include that. It also meant the unique American values and society of the rule of law, respect for the individual, and a strong economy, which actually could be argued that that broke uh, the Soviet Union as much as the buildup did, and as much as the talk about technology and Star Wars did, our economy helped make the communists realize that their failed ism could never overcome American freedom and ingenuity. Now take Russia and the Soviet Union out of that and insert China, and uh, that creates a whole interesting conversation um, as we all worry about what the future holds with the outbreak of Chinese corona, this virus that China unleashed on the world, whether because they're bumbling or because um, they're evil. Uh, someone will figure that out one day. Right now, we just have to do what's best for our families uh, and for our country. And to further that conversation on this most special days, we have Congressman Michael Waltz. You all know uh, the congressman. Uh, this is a new fancy title that he picked up recently uh, because of his years uh, on Fox News and on television and in media teaching us about these important issues. The, the congressman was a, a Green Beret. He served in Afghanistan and other theaters. Uh, he also helped advise some of the most important national security figures we've had uh, in recent years. Uh, Congressman Waltz, thanks for joining us on CPAC Live. Yeah, hey, great to be with you, Matt, and uh, great to be with you on Memorial Day of all days. So uh, the first question I have to ask you is, what's it like dealing with Nancy Pelosi? Well, you know, uh, you, you have to respect your adversary. You do, <laughs> uh, but but you got you, you got to appreciate her tactical skills, but just her vision for this country. Uh, look, I, I I can't emphasize enough uh, the the Green New Deal, um, uh, things like uh, the what they call the living wage, you know, thousands of dollars for everybody coming out of the taxpayer pockets. All of those left wing policies. They're passing out of the House right now. This isn't just hot air from Bernie bros. It's actually happening under Pelosi. And but for a few Senate seats and the, and the White House, that stuff will be becoming law. So this is, uh, you know, I think the fight of my future and my time in Congress, uh, and it is a fight, is twofold. One, stopping America from being led by socialists. And two, stopping the world from being led by Chinese communists. You know, as as you were mentioning coming in, and that is going to be the fight of our future. And uh, I'm just proud and honored to be down in the foxhole with folks like you and CPAC. And, uh, and, and look, this is this is the fight for our children's future that we're in right now. Well, you know, during CPAC, we sure felt like we were in a hole as even a lot of conservative conservative outlets. Uh, of which we have some real phony examples, and the mainstream media descended upon CPAC and our staff and our attendees, demanding to know the name of the one patient that was uh, being that we had uh, disclosed publicly, the only yeah. patient in the whole globe where it was demanded that the name be made public, and why? Right. Because that person was uh, a conservative, a Trump supporter. There has been this intent from the very beginning, although this is a serious tragedy in a serious situation with a virus, there was an intent by too many to imprint this as some kind of bungled job by President Trump and his administration. Um, and in the halls of Congress, you see that nakedly. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's the entire agenda. You know, it's it's trying to put this on the president. 
Uh, it's trying to put it on, you know, I'm, I'm represent Northeast Florida. It's trying to put it on our governor. It's trying to make this a, a partisan issue. Look, this is an American issue. And, uh, and if anybody wants to start pointing fingers, although I don't think now is quite the time, but if we're going to do that, we need to be pointing it squarely at the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, they, they covered this up. They haven't allowed the world or us access to ground zero. They haven't allowed us uh, access to really understand the data and the nature of this virus. And they were allowing literally tens of thousands of people to flow out of Wuhan all over the world at the same time they were blocking internal uh, travel. And meanwhile, they've co-opted organizations like the UN and the WHO who uh, were ignoring red flags from Taiwan, from Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, and others. So while I haven't seen any smoking guns that the Chinese Communist Party did this purposefully, I do think it was bungling. But I also think uh, they are smiling and President Xi is smiling as our economy craters, as we overreact, as people like Kamala Harris, you know, call folks like me and others uh, racist and xenophobes as we're trying to, to call this out for what it is, which is a Wuhan virus, a Chinese virus, and uh, th th this is playing right into the left's hands and it's playing right into the Chinese Communist Party's hands. But, you know, look, we'll keep fighting the fight, Matt. There, uh, Congressman, you know, there's been such a shift between uh, the Obama years, the dark eight years of Obama's policies, yeah. which included apologizing to people around the globe for America uh, and uh, bowing and scraping and projecting weakness, leading from behind. I can't stop thinking of the of the crazy and 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 really uh, weak uh, ways in which Obama uh, uh, engaged the world. Yeah. For your for your former Green Berets and your Army buddies and uh, the vets, what do they think about the change under President Trump? Well, look, I was downrange fighting in Afghanistan under Obama. Uh, in fact, I had to lead the search, unfortunately, for Bo Bergdahl, uh, led the special operations uh, out on the ground. By the way, who was leading the intelligence for all of that as a great American general was Mike Flynn. Uh, out in Afghanistan at the same time. That's a whole that's a whole separate issue that I'd love to talk to you about what's happened to him. But look, our, our hands were tied. The, the worst of both worlds is to be deployed away from your families, but then to have your hands tied by these by these ridiculous, over restrictive uh, rules of engagement uh, that the Obama administration had on us. And the, the difference when President Trump came in was night and day. He literally said, unleash the hounds. Let's take out ISIS. Let's take out Al Qaeda. Uh, you know, we've destroyed the caliphate. The movement is still there and we have to keep them on their back foot. But the caliphate, uh, the, which at one point was the, you know, the size of Austria, uh, is destroyed. And our enemies uh, who are like Iran, uh, and and uh, like Venezuela and others who are emboldened by weakness and deterred by strength are, are now deterred. Case in point with Iran, when we took out Soleimani, their field general, their Patton, their Rommel, so to speak. And guess what? We haven't heard much from Iran in the last in the last several months. So look, the, what the military wants to do, the best military in the world is to be able to do their job. If you're going to deploy them downrange, give them the resources and the training that they need. That's what this Congress and this president has done uh, in terms of their resources. And then let them go take our enemies down. And that's so, exactly uh, from Baghdadi to Soleimani and on down the list. That's exactly what President Trump has done. And it has been a breath of fresh air. So it's interesting, uh, it, it, a shift from trying to put the resources on finding a deserter, Bo Bergdahl, <laughs> Yeah. to president that comes in and says, it's not about finding Bo Bergdahl or the present uh, iteration of that. It's about finding Soleimani and Baghdadi and destroying yep. ISIS. That's projecting strength. At the same time, the American economy, which is basically allergic to socialism, and that's been demonstrated throughout our history and the history of all uh, free countries and unfree countries, um, the, the economy comes roaring back. When the economy comes roaring back uh, under President Trump, Congressman, 
doesn't that have a very positive effect on individual Americans, including vets, who sometimes, you know, have trouble getting back into the kind of the rhythm of yeah. non-military society uh, and trying to figure out how to, you know, put their boots on the ground economically to provide for their family. When the economy comes running back, don't they do better? Yeah, everybody, everybody talks about it, uh, you know, getting veterans uh, jobs and what have you. I have a saying, look, if you want to support your veteran, hire one. Uh, but right. if there's no jobs there to hire them into because the economy's, uh, you know, in the tank, then that's pretty hard to do. So, you know, the, the, the rising tide lifts all boats and President Trump knows that. But to your point on foreign, on foreign policy and national security, everybody focuses on the big stick of our military. That's not the big stick. The big stick is our economy that undergirds uh, our military and our strength abroad, our ability to levy sanctions, the strength of the dollar, you know, all of those things. Right. That's what President Trump instinctively knows, but that's also what China knows. And the, the rise of China, what China knows, uh, it, as they try to be the world's global dominant superpower in their own words that they plan to do by the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party in 2049, is by stealing our technology, surpassing us economically, so that any type of military conflict is just fait accompli. So uh, let me and, and that's exactly what they're doing. And I've been uh, uh, fighting that fight in Congress, cutting off money to the Chinese Communist Party that is coming through our pensions, believe it or not, and then cutting off their access to our technology that they're doing through our universities. 400,000 Chinese students are coming here a year. And then they're buying off our professors, like the Harvard right. professor that was taking millions uh, in, in Defense Department research, but then taking hundreds of thousands from the Chinese and taking it right over there. That's well, we have a real, to the top. Congressman, we have a real chance with higher education um, to transform things. It's, it's one of the only few positive things that could come out of, of this Chinese corona episode in our history, which is... Uh, you have some people like Mitch Daniels. I saw that my alma mater, mater uh, at the University of Notre Dame, Hillsdale College. You have you have a handful of colleges now saying they will open up in the fall. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I think those colleges that are doing that are they're demonstrating courage and common sense. They also understand that if you don't open up, how do you get all those expensive tuition checks? <laughs> and if if uh, we can actually start to scrutinize higher ed. I think it gives us a real chance to like wash out the influence of the communist, uh, yeah. communist Chinese government in those uh, most prestigious of institutions. Well, that's that's absolutely right. And I, and, you know, I'd add to that that the Florida University system is also going to open. Look, we that's don't because need... you have a great. That's because you have a great governor who you followed yeah. in Congress. Uh, yeah, I took his uh, I took his seat, and even though they're Navy shoes and mine are Army shoes, but uh, <laughs> we give each other a hard time. Uh, look, the, the these higher um, institutions, Harvard, Yale, the Ivy Leagues, they're addicted. These Chinese students pay full freight. Uh, they're addicted to that revenue. And the other piece that we're going to expose is they have been taking hundreds of millions of dollars in foreign influence money and not reporting it to the Department of Education. And we're going to expose all of that, not to mention, like I said, the professors in, I mean, these aren't professors of basket weaving. These are professors of nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, advanced materials that again have taken millions and millions of taxpayer funded Defense Department intelligence community research dollars. And then they're going to the Wuhan Institute of Technology, literally, and taking fifty, a hundred thousand dollars a month in, uh, in in money in their back pocket and transferring right. that, it goes right to the Chinese military. It's part of a broader campaign. So the uh, so uh, yeah. you know the Bush administration, obviously the focus was on radical Islamic terrorism in the wake of 9/11. You, you've had you've had this most interesting of careers uh, in the military now as an elected member of Congress, but. I got to ask you this question. Who is a meaner boss, Gates, Rumsfeld, or Cheney? <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, uh, Rumsfeld was, he was, he was brutal to brief. 
Uh, he really was. Whether you're a four-star general or you know policy advisor like me, Cheney though was the smartest guy in the room, right? He was chief of staff of the president at 33, back under uh, back under Ford. He had been around the block a lot of times. You know the thing with Cheney was uh, even to the very last day, no more 9/11s on my watch. I mean that was the mission, period, and taking these guys down. He was just a great great boss to work for. But I got to tell you one other thing. I was there in the transition from Bush to Obama and the mission from the top from President Bush and Vice President Cheney was we're a nation at war. When it comes to handing things over to the Obama administration, leave no stone unturned, right. hand everything over. And what we've seen now, how Obama treated President Trump, Mike Flynn and other and withholding information because of these conspiracy theories they had because they had it out from Mike Flynn from the beginning, uh, was, it, it, is, it is just, it's beyond below the let, belt. Let me, uh, let me punctuate this. borderline this. treasonous. Let, I agree with you. Let me punctuate this. Um, I do think it makes sense uh, that we don't follow the South Korean model or the Brazilian model and some of these other places where the, the person leaving the highest uh, government uh, job gets prosecuted by the party that then comes in. Now, if there's wrongdoing, uh, that's obviously a clear wrongdoing, especially stealing money that's much more justifiable. But we yeah, don't want to fall into this kind of thing where the previous president starts going to jail. So I understand why Bill Barr is giving a caution. But I do agree with you that this was very, very, very serious. And I, I will just tell you, I didn't serve in the second uh, Bush 43 term. I served in the first. My wife served in the first. But I was involved with the conversations around making sure that the incoming Obama administration got everything it needed. Matter of fact, it got so absurd that uh, there was a dictate that went out to the White House political office, an office I had run in the first administration, yeah. to prepare a binder to the Obama people to know how to run the political office well. And everyone in the political office was like, we don't want them <laughs> to know how to run this well. Because we want yeah. to beat them. Both parties, by the way, each party wants to beat the other. This should not become a shock. But when it comes to questions of national security and how the government runs, the, the Bush administration was almost too much of a red carpet, but they really were playing it straight. And what you're saying is when Obama was moving to the transition, Trump wins the election, they did everything, everything to Trip use their up. powers, including in the intelligence community and the FBI, to take him down. That's right. Well, it's the most fragile. I think it is the most fragile time. We often take it for granted. But in our republic, when the party going out of power is different than the party coming in, but that party leaving still has power and still has the ability to uh, uh, to abuse it. And I think that's absolutely what happened here. And you're right. In the Bush administration, we rolled out the red carpet, nation at war, hand them everything. And now to say that they were holding back information on our adversary, Russia. And this wasn't, you know, it's not like Mike Flynn was some political hack. He was a military intelligence general. Who had been had fired by with, Obama. That's the critical uh, uh, who, piece here. Well, who was hired by Obama to be the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, but then Clapper, Brennan, and others went after him because they didn't like uh, some of the things that he wanted to do, uh, particularly in what was going on with Obama and really shooing aside the threat from Islamic extremism as he wanted to get out of Afghanistan and Iraq. And he even wanted so, to, he wanted to use those words which uh, ran afoul. Islamic of extremism, Obama. yeah. Yeah, the That's Obama right. mentality, which was that was somehow racist or uh, yeah. xenophobic, to quote Joe Biden. But I want to, I want to, I want our yeah. uh, viewers to understand something else, which is uh, when I came into the Bush administration, when the whole team came in after that election in 2000, you know, all of our W's were taken off our keyboards, all of our voicemail systems had been disabled with uh, all kinds of ridiculous uh, activities, really childish activities, which hobbled us for weeks as we were trying to get started. Um, Congressman, don't you think we have to get back? Now, we've talked about two examples of Democrats post-Watergate following the Watergate example, right? Mm -hmm. So the Watergate example is an example of Republicans doing the wrong thing. But then the Democrats not only prosecute that, they begin to 
use similar tactics. When it comes to national security, is there any hope we can put partisanship aside and get back to all being Americans when we realize the threats coming from China, the threats coming from these radical terrorists who want to destroy us and call us the great Satan, and the other ways in which communism and socialism undermines uh, the freedom of all people? Yeah, I think so, Matt. I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist on America, uh, and I think one of the things that would really help, particularly on the, um, the Democrats, is to get more veterans uh, into office. I would, of course, rather than be conservatives and rather than be Republicans, but the extent we're going to have Democrats, I would want them to be veterans. I, I'm on the Armed Services Committee and on the Space Committee, and uh, I work with Democrats who are veterans there. Uh, they, they understand what China is up to and their long game to defeat us economically. They've fought against uh, Islamic uh, radicalism. And you know, Matt, when you're in the foxhole on the plane, on the ship, nobody cares about race, religion, social economic background. It's not like we're on the black helicopter in the middle of the night going, are, you know, are you Hispanic? Are you Jewish? Are you Republican or Democrat? Nobody cares. It's about being American. I think that mentality is absolutely what we need to get back to. But right now, we're at a record low in the Congress. We've gone from a high of 80% veterans to now hovering around 18%. And I think that it's, that it's not about agreeing on everything. It's just that ethos of service that we have to get back to. And you know, as we're talking about a Memorial Day, you know, one of the things that inspires me every single day are the, are the Green Berets that I lost in combat. One of them, uh, Staff Sergeant Woods, had premonitions of his own death so strong that he had written letters to every one of his teammates, to his family, to his wife. And yet the day he was killed, he wasn't sitting back in his base saying, hey, you guys go. He was leading the charge into an enemy machine gun nest. Uh, just an incredible uh, individual. And his guys were able to keep him alive long enough to get him to a hospital so that we flew his wife over to spend one night last evening with him. And my uh, one of my others, I just wanna tell you about very quickly, volunteered to be on point every single mission. We knew the Taliban were using tripwires and he, uh, you know, the guy was really sharp. He volunteered uh, to be out front every single time out on a motorcycle ahead of our armored convoys and when I asked him about why are you doing, you know, every single mission, he said, I can be down close to the ground so I can see the tripwires. And just in case we miss one, it'll only get me instead of four or five of my fellow Green Berets in the vehicles. Those are the kinds, those are the kinds of Americans that, that we've lost, that sacrificed for us. I wake up, you know, Matt, I wear one of these bracelets every day. And man, I wake up every day, uh, I look in the mirror, I put on this bracelet and say, be worthy. And kind of my message to everyone is be worthy of that sacrifice. Um, you know, we're gonna, have our, we're gonna have our partisan divisions and we're gonna fight that fight hard. But at the end of the day, we're all Americans. And when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party, the Russians or others, that's how we've gotta think. We're Americans at the end of the day. Their bullets don't discriminate. This virus doesn't discriminate. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, we have to fight as one country. Well, Congressman Michael Waltz, we appreciate you being with us on CPAC Live. I agree with you. I, I'd like to have more vets and less lawyers. Uh, you know, that should be what we uh, track. Uh, although I know there are some good lawyers, uh, including uh, Bill Barr and Pat Cipollone and others. But uh, how about fewer lawyers? They're, 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 they're a necessary thing, but I want, more, I want people with business sense that have had to run businesses right. and understand how to grow this economy and people that were willing to die for this economy. I'd rather them be conservatives, but at the end of the day, I think the, the, the more the merrier. Uh, Congressman Waltz, stay yeah. there and watch this most touching of videos uh, from the President's State of the Union address when Sergeant Townsend Williams comes in and surprises his family. We'll be right back with you right after this video. War places a heavy burden on our nation's extraordinary military families, especially spouses like Amy Williams from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and her two children, six-year-old Eliana and three-year-old Rowan. 
Amy works full-time and volunteers countless hours helping other military families. For the past seven months, she has done it all while her husband, Sergeant First Class Townsend Williams, is in Afghanistan on his fourth deployment in the Middle East. Amy's kids haven't seen their father's face in many months. Amy, your family's sacrifice makes it possible for all of our families to live in safety and in peace, and we want to thank you. Thank you, Amy. But, Amy, there is one more thing. Tonight, we have a very special surprise. I am thrilled to inform you that your husband is back from deployment. He is here with us tonight, and we couldn't keep him waiting any longer. That's a great video. Uh, what a special moment for the Williams family. And it harkens us back to a time before this current uh, Chinese corona pandemic scare uh, that we've all been facing. And, you know, when we think about the struggles in our own lives, uh, Memorial Day is an awfully important day to put everything in perspective. Uh, some people are worried about going to restaurants and going out and leaving their houses. But let's put that in context with uh, the people who have paid the ultimate price, joining the military, uh, you know, being recruited into the military, being drafted into the military, fighting great evil and threats to America and uh, America's way of life and our freedoms and paying the ultimate price. So on Memorial Day, let's not forget uh, our fallen and let's hold them up and let's talk about the stories as Congressman Waltz did of the heroes. Because I think uh, my five kids, your kids, your grandkids, they need to hear about these brave men and women who paid the price of their lives to try to make sure this experiment with democracy in America continues. We all know this, but if America ceases to exist, uh, in a dominant way on the globe, it's going to be bad for all people who desire freedom. And in this most particular struggle with the communist government in China, it's awfully important that we be strong militarily and be strong economically, which is one of the reasons why so many of us and so many of you know it's important to get the economic wheels turning immediately. Uh, we appreciate you joining us on CPAC Live. Uh, we're going to have Congressman Doug Collins with us uh, later in the week. And uh, keep tuning in. Go to conservative.org. Go to Twitter. Go to Facebook. Keep watching the show. I think it's good therapy for all of us and gets us all pumped up for the struggles and fights to come. We'll see you again on Wednesday, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.